Hello, Shoreline family. Welcome to our home. We hope you had a wonderful Christmas day yesterday, and we are praying for all of God's best in the coming year. Today we focus on the topic of the arrival of hope. And we're going to celebrate the fact that when Jesus came into this world, hope came. When Jesus enters our lives, hope shows up. And when we walk into the world, we bring the hope of Jesus with us. I've asked Sherry to pray for God's blessing as we open God's word together. Dear Jesus, we worship you. We thank you for giving us the greatest gift ever, life with you now and forevermore. Jesus, you are the hope of the world. You are our hope in every day as we seek to live for you. I pray that you prepare our hearts to receive the words that you have given to Kevin, the message that you have put on his heart, that we would take it in and that it would change us in this coming year, understanding what it means that you give us hope every single day of our lives. We pray this in your precious name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, I hope you joined in with all your heart in that prayer that Sherry just lifted up, that God's hope would enter our homes and our lives, that God's hope would enter our church, our community as God's people, and that the hope of Jesus Christ would just come cascading and covering our whole earth because, because we need it. Now, the challenge with the word hope in our world today is we don't use the word the way that the Bible uses the word. When we say, I hope, we kind of mean, hey, hope it works out for you. Hope that, hope that goes well for you. Keep your fingers crossed. We'll see how it goes. It's not, it's not a sense of a bold confidence. The biblical idea of hope is an absolutely bold confidence in what we believe. I put my hope in Jesus Christ. Not I cross my fingers, hope it works out, but I, I, I bet my life on it because he paid his life for it. I mean, I'm confident in what Jesus has done. But in our world, it's very different. But, but, but when you think about it, if somebody talks about living with hope, I think there's many ways we do have sense, a sense of a bold confidence. Think about a couple getting married. It's their wedding day. What do you see on their faces? What look is there? There's hope. But it's not a hope that says, you know, hope this works out. If, if you were standing at the altar as a couple and somebody says, we're so excited for your new life together. And, and the, the husband to be right before the, the, the wedding ceremony says, well, I hope it works out. Uh, the bride's going to kind of be like, wait a minute, you hope? No, no, th there's this bold confidence. We're going into this trusting. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about that in, in our living room here where, where we are right now. Uh, we have this, uh, the wedding ceremony of Sherry Lynn Vleem, Sherry's maiden name, and Kevin Garth Harney on June 29th, 1984. We're drifting towards four decades of being married together. But when I open this up, and, and we'll show you a picture of this, what I'm looking at right now, but I see Sherry and I standing at the altar side by side. And on our faces is hope, a longing for what lies ahead. And 38, almost 39 years later, we're still living with that hope. There's a hope that holds to what we long for with bold confidence. Think about a, uh, a, a captain and a co-captain, a pilot and a co-pilot on a plane. When you get on a plane, if they got the door open and they're you know, saying hi to people going by and you say, hey, you know, thanks, thanks for, for flying us to uh, Denver, wherever, wherever we're heading off to. And they just say, well, we hope we make it. <laughs> hope the plane stays together. Hope we stay in the air. No, no, there, there's sort of a bold confidence. When you get on a plane, you expect it to take off safely and to land safely. That's a, the biblical idea of hope, this bold confidence. When a person goes into surgery, same deal. You don't say, hope this works out. You go trusting. There's skillful surgeons, anesthesiologists, a nursing team, and they're going to do a great job. You go in with, with a confidence, with a trust, and, and that's the biblical concept of hope. So then, when we look at Jesus on the cross, the one who came to this world, God with us, Emmanuel, perfectly pure and holy, and we say, I place my hope in Jesus. We're not saying, I hope what he said is true. We're saying, I place my life in a hopeful confidence that what Jesus said was true, what he did is real, that his resurrection is true, and that I belong to him. Now, I didn't grow up in the church, and some of you grew up in the, around the church, and so you might know some of the great hymns of the church from your upbringing. I learned them later on in life. The, church, the first church I served as a senior pastor, we had a morning service, 
and, and it was kind of more of a contemporary style service, but in the evening, different sermon, different music. Hold, I, I, was, I wrote two sermons a week for, for about uh, 14 years for the Sunday morning and the Sunday evening services. And Sunday evenings, the music was usually hymns. It was organ, it was more traditional. And, and there's this one hymn called On Christ the Solid Rock, the Solid Rock. And, and here's some of the words of that hymn. Listen to these words. On Christ the Solid Rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Jesus is, is, the, is the rock. Well, be, before that, in the song, you declare these words. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. And then you declare, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. That's the message of hope for us this day after Christmas, this week leading in to a new year, as we close a tough, challenging, difficult 2021, as we look ahead to the new year, can we walk in the reality that when Jesus came, he was the arrival of hope. Hope entered our world and hope entered our lives. I want to invite you to listen to these words from Romans chapter 8. If you have a Bible handy, you can grab that Bible. If you have Bible on your phone or on an iPad or something, turn to Romans chapter 8 and listen to these words. The Apostle Paul writes these words inspired by the Holy Spirit. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have been the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption to become children, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But listen to this. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. If we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. That's hope. A bold confidence in Jesus Christ. For Christians, our hope is built on nothing less and nothing other than Jesus, his sacrifice, his righteousness. And we can stand on that rock even as we go into this new year. And so through this entire series, as we've been walking through the idea of the arrival of Jesus, and, and you'll know if you've been with us, maybe, maybe you're new and visiting with us online, so glad you're with us. Maybe you're celebrating Christmas with family or friends and you haven't been following our series. So what we've been talking about for this whole Christmas season is that when Jesus arrived, the arrival of Jesus, first when Jesus arrived 2,000 years ago, there was an arrival of hope. Jesus came into the world and he arrived in the Incarnation. When, he, when God took on flesh and became as one of us, hope arrived. But now in our lives today, anyone who's put their faith in Jesus, when you receive him, or if you one day put your faith in Jesus, at that moment, the hope of God arrives in your life. When I was 15 years old and became a Christian, the hope of God captured my heart. Not a little, I hope it all works out, but an absolute confidence in what Jesus had done and who he is. I call that inspiration. When he first came 2,000 years ago, incarnation. When he comes into our lives, it's inspiration. You walk through your life with a confidence in the hope of Jesus Christ. And then, as we who know Jesus, we in whom the Spirit of God dwells and we're filled with hope, we walk into the world, and watch this now, the hope of Jesus arrives where? Everywhere we go. If you go to school, in the workplace, in your neighborhood, visiting a friend, on the golf course, driving down the road, God's hope goes with you. And, and that, that, that is the illustration. We show the hope of Jesus through our lives. So the, the incarnation 2,000 years ago, hope came into human history. And then the, the reality that, the, that Jesus Christ, when he comes into our lives, hope comes, and we're filled with that hope, and we're overwhelmed with his hope. And, and so, so we then are inspired, the, the, the incarnation, the inspiration of Jesus, and then we illustrate his hope as we walk through this life. So let's walk through that together and just think about a few things and how those connect to our lives this Christmas season. 
So first, the first arrival is the incarnation 2,000 years ago. When Jesus came to our world, hope came to the longing and the waiting. When Jesus showed up in our world, when, the, when Jesus was born in a manger, there were people longing, waiting for what God was bringing into the world. Jesus is the hope. He is the hope and source of our salvation. When, when Jesus came, he said, I offer hope and salvation to who? To anyone who will receive his gift, who will open up their hearts. And so, so when you look at Jesus coming into this world, he's really saying, put your hope in me. All generations, all people at all times. And we're tempted to put our hope in other things. Many people are putting their hope in government. Boy, if my team wins, if my side's in charge, then life will be perfect. And most of us have figured out that life is not made perfect by who's in power in a political sense. It's the hope that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, and he's on the throne. He rules and he reigns. Now, we should be involved in our, in our, in our you know, civic uh, world. We should, be, we should be praying, engaged, and, and seeking to do all things that would honor God in our world. But at the end of the day, our hope is not in governing authorities. Our hope is not in what's in our bank account. If I get enough money saved, I can live with confidence and hope. No, my hope is in Jesus, who came 2,000 years ago, who's still here today. So well, I'm going to put my hope in the right relationships. If I can meet the right person, and that person, and that person fulfills me, we can say, you complete me. Kind of mushy, kind of, oh, you, no, no, no. Jesus completes me. He completes you. And then the relationships are a bonus. But our hope is built on Jesus. And, and, and then you say, well, listen, if I can just pull my life together and kind of, kind of organize things and get myself on the right track, I can be hopeful because I'm making everything work. At the end of the day, the day that won't do it either unless we have Jesus. And then when Jesus is in our lives, he can have impact in, in our, in our you know, civic interactions. He can have impact in how we handle our finances. He can impact our relationships. He can impact everything. And so when Jesus came, he brought hope to our world. He's the hope of our hope and our salvation. And then the prophets pointed the way and built up expectations. All through the Old Testament, uh, people were waiting and longing, prophesying of the coming of Jesus. A virgin will conceive and, and, and have a son. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. He'll be born in Bethlehem. All these prophecies, where he would be born, how he would live, how he would enter in Jerusalem at the end of his life, how he would die in our place for our sins. The prophets prepared the way for hope to come. And so people were waiting in Jesus' day, anticipating his coming. And when Jesus came, the hope of the nations entered human history, even to those who did not recognize him. When Jesus entered human history, uh, his hope came. He came in a way that was undeniable and powerful. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, there, there's this powerful passage beginning in verse 10. And it really talks about the hope of God and the holiness, which we've also talked about in this series, that when Jesus came, holiness came. When he enters our lives, holiness comes within us. When we walk into the world, we reflect holiness to the world. But here in 1 Peter, listen to these words in chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he was predicting the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. So they were waiting, they were anticipating through the Old Testament before Jesus came, anticipating what was going to happen when the Messiah would come. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. Because Jesus wasn't going to come in their lifetime, he was coming at another time. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel, to you, the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. Think about it. Angels long to see what we've seen when we see Jesus Christ. And it continues on in verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope Set, establish, build your hope. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. 
Set your hope on the one who would come. When Jesus came, he brought hope. He brought holiness. God came among us. And so my encouragement for all of us is to look at the coming of Jesus, the first arrival, more than 2,000 years ago, and recognize that the hope that the world was longing for, the hope that the prophets had pointed towards, had entered human history. Praise God. But it doesn't end there. When we put our faith in Jesus, if you're a Christian, when you put your faith in Jesus, hope entered your life. And if you're not a Christian, the moment you put your faith in Jesus, the hope of heaven moves in and changes your perspective. Here's the second arrival, the arrival we call inspiration when Jesus comes into us. Jesus is here with us and in us. His presence and coming give us bold hope each day. The presence and coming of Jesus give us hope, bold hope, each and every single day. We find hope in his sacrificial suffering. It seems strange to say that the Jesus who was born in the manger came to die on a cross. And we take hope in the reality that he paid the price for us. That when Jesus said, it is finished, it's paid in full, he was talking about our sins. That brings us hope. All of our guilt taken away, that gives us hope. Washing us clean of all of our sins, our shame, our fears washed away, that gives us hope. Hope in his sacrificial suffering. We also live in the hope of his daily presence and power. Because Jesus came, and because he has sent the Holy Spirit to move into and live in everyone who puts their faith in Jesus. When you come to the cross, or when you came to the cross, and you say, Jesus, I accept your forgiveness and your love and your grace. I take your hand. I'm going to follow you. He moves into you, and you have the presence of the hope-filled Jesus in all you do, and his power to press through. That should bring you and me incredible hope every day of our lives. And then we are confident in the hope of heaven. It's not just a hope for right now in this life. When you know that Jesus has moved into your life, you have hope of eternity. Ones that you love, who have died in faith, who've gone ahead of you, will see them again. You'll see them again. My dad, who put his faith in Jesus in the last month of his life, I will see him again. People who've mentored me, who poured into my life, who in the last couple of years, in the last couple of decades, have passed away. I will see them again. I will see Jesus face to face. And the glory and the beauty of heaven, which is greater than we can comprehend. I mean, the Bible uses, uses these little pictures to try to give us a glimpse. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's like streets of gold. It's like, you know, just beautiful colors and jewels. And, you know, taking all the things of the world that can try to create the most, the greatest sense of provision and comfort and God's presence. He's with us. Every tear wiped away, pain is gone. It's a great banquet, great food. Streets of gold, they're, they're, there's no lack at all. All those images are, are, are to say, you can't begin to comprehend the glory of heaven. That hope came when Jesus moved into your life. And remember, biblical hope isn't, I hope it works out, hope I make it to heaven someday. Let me tell you, if you have come to the cross, you've received Jesus Christ, you've confessed your sins, you said, I can't wash my sins away, but Jesus, you died for me, and I accept your grace, I accept your forgiveness and I take your hand, I am your person, I'm your, I'm your daughter, I'm your son, I will follow you. If you've done that, live with absolute confidence and hope that your sins are washed away, that heaven is your home, and Jesus has gone ahead of you like he said he would to prepare a place for you. And that should give you hope in the good moments and in the tough moments of this life. So let me ask you a question. How does your hope in Jesus lead you to holiness in your daily life. See, hope isn't just about someday. It's about this day. When you put your hope in Jesus, when you know that heaven is your home, your sins are washed away, you belong to Jesus, should that change the way you live today? And you know the answer to that question. The answer is a resounding yes. It doesn't mean that we are perfected and do everything right all the time. We still stumble, we still struggle, but we are striving to live more and more like Jesus. And the more we live like Jesus, the less we look like the world. Not in a weird, awkward way. It doesn't mean that if people are, are dressing a certain way, we're always 30 years behind in the styles. 
Because you know what? That style was pretty hot 30 years ago. It's not, it's not a matter of style. It's a matter of living with a heart that loves and forgives and cares like Jesus. Holiness is standing apart and looking different. Too many people used to think, well, holiness is, I don't play cards. You know, I, I know people who grew up in homes where they weren't allowed to have cards, and when grandpa or grandma would come over who were very, very holy, they'd hide the cards, and they'd hide all kinds of things because those weren't seen. Well, playing cards isn't an issue of holiness. Holiness is being set apart, looking different, walking in the ways of Jesus, and that, that makes us pure, yes, but it also makes us look different. So when you forgive and others don't, you stand apart. When you're generous and others aren't, you stand apart, holiness. When you love those who've hurt you and wronged you and no one else does, you stand apart, you're set apart, you look different. When you understand the hope of Jesus, that salvation is yours, your sins are washed away, his presence and his power wrap around you every moment of every day, and that heaven is your home, you take the hand of Jesus and you follow more and more closely. And the closer you walk with Jesus, the more you look like him, sound like him, think like him, and the more you don't look like your old self. And that's okay. It's a beautiful thing. And most people will look at that and find themselves thinking, I wish I was kinder like that. I wish I could serve people the way she does. I wish I was generous the way he is. I wish I could navigate relationships and not just blow up and lose all the time like, like that person does. People will actually long for what Jesus is doing in you. So let him transform your life now and all the time. In the book of Colossians, uh, there's this uh, wonderful passage. If you have your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter 1. And I want to begin in verse 24. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1, 24 and following. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. That's God's people. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among all the nations the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. To share with all the nations, all the people, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, Jesus coming to this world, he brought hope into a dark and hopeless time. The, the, the very, when Jesus entered the, the, the human world, when he entered our human condition, when he came as one of us, it was a tough time in the history of the world. There was darkness, and he came bringing light. He came as hope into what seemed like a hopeless time. When Jesus came into your life, he brought hope to every nook and cranny and part of your heart that was broken and felt hopeless. He begins to breathe hope and new life. And if you don't yet know Jesus, I'll tell you, when you put your faith in him, he offers a hope this world can never offer. So in the incarnation, hope came. When we receive Jesus, his hope, or hope enters us, and that is an inspiration to live for him. But it doesn't stop there. We become an illustration of hope to the world. We begin to walk out into the world with Jesus dwelling in us, his hope in us, and we show hope to a world that's wondering, is there anything you could hope in anymore? Is there anything you can have a bold, firm confidence in? And then right now, there is an erosion of confidence in you name it. And people are questioning all kinds of things. But if you understand who Jesus is and what he's done, you then begin to walk in his hope. So here's the third arrival. The arrival, it's an illustration as we walk with Jesus. When we walk into any room, Jesus comes with us. And we bring hope to a hopeless generation. You can bring hope wherever you go. We model bold hope and confidence in the truth of God's word as an anchor in the storms. When we walk with Jesus, and we understand that Jesus is the living word, but this book is the written word of God, it becomes an anchor of truth. And, and we model hope in that we understand the truth of God's word. We live in a time and in a world where people just say, there's nothing you can really stake your life on. There's nothing that you can be confident in. And I believe actually that, that this Holy Spirit breathed word of God is a truth that gives us hope. 
I, I can walk in the truth of Jesus and hope with bold confidence that he will fulfill what he says. When, when Sherry and I met and Sherry started to talk to me about generosity, I grew up in a home that was generous in certain ways, but we weren't Christian, and so I wasn't generous towards the church. I didn't give towards the work of Jesus. I was planning on being a pastor, but I wasn't giving anything to my church. And Sherry, who grew up in a home where they had a bold hope in Jesus and a confidence, so they were always generous to the, thing, the things of the Lord. Her dad and her mom set aside their first 10% of every paycheck. He, Sherry's dad would literally cash his check, take 10% of the cash, put it in an envelope, put it on top of the refrigerator. It stayed there till Sunday, put it in a suit coat pocket, go to church, and went in the offering plate. But they also took the other 90% of what they had, and they lived with open hands. I didn't live with that kind of hope. I wasn't transformed that way, but my wife challenged me. And now, decades later, I can say, I so trust in God, I so believe in the truth of His Word, that if I am generous the way God's called me to, He will provide all I need. Now, you're, I'm talking to you from my living room, in our house. Some of you might have heard the story, some of you maybe have not, but before Sherry and I got married, I said to Sherry, we'll never own a home. You're marrying a guy who never plans to own a home. Are you okay with that? She grew up in West Michigan where when you're going to get married, you got your first kind of starter house and then down the line you get your next house and everyone had a house because it was affordable. I grew up in Orange County, California. At the time, interest rates were 14.9%. Sherry, Sherry said, I want to have a family and I want to be at home raising our kids so we're going to live a one income, a pastor's income in Orange County with interest rates out the roof. So I said, just honey, we'll never own a home. Are you, are you still in for this thing? You still want to marry me? She said, yes. We also then began being faithful in our giving. And I guess I lied to my wife. It's, it's, it's a lie she can handle. I told her we'll never own a home. And this is, this is my fireplace. This is my mantle. Never plan on having, I, I didn't plan on any of this. But I did plan to follow the truth of God's word. And he came through and provided in ways I could have never dreamed of. That's one of a hundred illustrations I could give you, that when you follow this book, put your hope in Jesus, he will reveal his truth and lead you forward. We model bold hope and confidence in the reality that God leads and guides us. As you're walking with Jesus, as people watch you, do you say, I know that God is leading. I can seek his Holy Spirit. I can ask him to direct my steps and guide my path. I can follow his word. I can follow the wisdom of others, but I can follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and God will lead my paths. Do you believe that? That's a hope. That's a confidence. When you walk with that, there's people that will look and say, man, I wish I had confidence. I feel like I'm walking in the dark all the time and have no idea where I'm going. And I say, well, and I'm not walking in the dark. I have the light of Jesus. He lights my path. He shows me where to go. Sometimes you got to pray and wait on those things, but he shows. He guides. We model bold hope and confidence in the promise of salvation and eternal life in Jesus. We live every single day understanding that this is not the end of the story. This is the beginning. See, some people think this life is, this is it. And as you go through the years, you're coming to the end of your story, and then the book's closed, and you're done with. Our hope is that through faith in Jesus, this is just, the, this is the beginning of the story, but get this, this isn't the best part. When we walk into the presence of Jesus, when we walk with him into eternity, we'll recognize that all the best was yet to come. And I love the picture in the book, in the Chronicles of Narnia, one of my, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite authors, and uh, never met him, he passed away, he, you know, I never had a chance to meet him, uh, but I've read so much of his stuff, and in the Chronicles of Narnia, these children's books, but the last one, called The Last Battle, at the end, these kids that are kind of, the, that kind of carry through all the stories are in heaven, basically. And they're going further on and higher up, and they're with, this, they're with the Christ figure in those stories, Aslan, as he's bounding up the, the hills, and they're going further on and higher, it's just getting better and better, and you get the sense that, that every step is just more beautiful than the step before. That's the hope of heaven. That's the hope of Jesus. And when we live walking that way, we become an inspiration to others, because they look and they, they think, you, you really believe that? You believe in the hope of heaven? You believe that, that, that what lies ahead is infinitely better than the best moment right now. And I say this, yes, I put my hope in it. Jesus gave his life for it. I stake my life on it, and I walk and I live in that hope. Here's a question for you. When people look at you, do they see hope, and are they drawn to the God of hope? When people look at you, 
do they say, oh, if I could have that kind of hope, that kind of bold confidence, now and for all that lies ahead. And they can. And maybe in 2022, you will so hold to Jesus and so walk with Jesus, you'll experience that. After the first Sunday of the year, we're going to go into a, into a two-month journey as a congregation. And what does it mean to grow up deep in our faith? We're going to talk about organic, natural discipleship. What does it mean to grow as a follower of Jesus? We're going to have an amazing 2022 together. I want you to begin praying for that. Saying, God, let me live in hope as I get ready for the new year. And let me jump in with both feet, January and February at Shoreline Church, to be growing in my faith as I walk with Jesus and become all that he wants me to be. And as I become more like Jesus, I shine his light in this world that needs the hope and the light of Jesus. I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'm going to hand you off to another one of our pastors, to Brandon. You're going to be with Brandon in his living room with a special friend he has there to close our time together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the hope that you bring to our lives, that when you entered this world, the longing world, the longing seekers who had heard of your coming as Messiah were waiting. And Jesus, you fulfilled that. You brought hope to the world 2,000 years ago. But Jesus, when we open our hearts to you, you you just move in with an overwhelming, glorious reality of the hope of heaven, the hope of salvation, the hope of your presence and power. So Lord, may we walk into each day in this new year coming ahead of us, walking in your hope, walking in bold confidence in what you promised and shining your light to each person we encounter. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. God bless you. Well, what an incredible morning it was, just joining in with each other from the comfort of our own living rooms. I'm sitting here with my dog, Sadie, and I know many of you are sitting around with your family enjoying a hot cup of coffee or a hot cup of tea, but it was amazing just to worship together and to hear Pastor Kevin teach on the arrival of hope. And one thing we love here at Shoreline is praying for our people. And so if you're joining with us this morning and you could use prayer, I wanna encourage you to send an email to prayer at shoreline.church and it would be an honor to pray for you this morning. And if you found us online and you are brand new to Shoreline, I wanna encourage you to text the word welcome to 831-221-0290 and we will send you our digital connect card and we will reach out and connect with you as well. From all of us at Shoreline, we are glad that you're with us this morning and we cannot wait to see you January 2nd as Pastor Kevin continues in the series the arrival of new beginnings. From all of us at Shoreline, Merry Christmas. See you in the new year.